There are two readings this morning. The first is from Micah 5, 2 to 4, and the second is from Matthew 1, 18 to 23. Micah 5, 2 to 4. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. Matthew, Joseph accepts Jesus as his son. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. For the word of the Lord. Today we're going to continue on with this series which I've entitled Expectation and Arrival and it's our Advent series and we're, we're thinking about having hearts that are anticipating the coming of Jesus. On one level we're anticipating the coming of the Christ child which is uh, the celebration of what God has done, the incarnation where we, we see this wonderful miracle of God becoming fully human Yet at the same time, we live in that tension where we know that Jesus has said that he is going to return. So on one level, we look back to the coming of Jesus, but at the same time, we look forward to the coming of Jesus. That's a really strange thing, isn't it? It's called being in that tension of expectation and arrival, living in the present, the now, but the not yet as well. We know that, the, that God has done everything possible to redeem us but we're living in that time where we're waiting expectantly for that redemption. So let me pray. Loving God, as we think about Advent and arrival and expectation, Lord, would you open our hearts to receive your word, to hear what you would have to say to us today? Lord, we ask that you would do a work in us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning I come with great news, great news, the Big Bash season is upon us and we have cricket on our televisions every single night leading up to Christmas, isn't that wonderful, come on, I, I actually, I was looking for my Melbourne Renegades cap this morning and I couldn't find it, I was going to wear it you know. And I was hoping that you would all wear your Melbourne Renegades caps as well, of course. Yes? No. <laughs> I, was, I was very excited. Melbourne Stars, I watched them the other night. So the thing is, I, I was watching the Melbourne Stars and, and I was really excited to see Glenn Maxwell playing for the Melbourne Stars. You know he used to play for the Renegades, don't you? Anyway, Mel, he's a pretty good player. He knows how to hit a ball. Um, over in India recently, he hit over 200 runs and beat Afghanistan for Australia. We were looking at losing that match and uh, that was great. 
But, you know, what gets me about these guys that hit these balls is the skill that they have. You know, they, they know the ball is coming and, and they've got this certain skill that I don't have. Some of you might have it. But, you know, they know where they want that ball to land and they, they line it up and they've got the technique and they, and they plan it in their minds before it happens. And when they hit that ball, whack, and there's a trajectory for that ball that they see it, they see that trajectory before it actually happens because they're planning for it and, and they're using what they have so they have a trajectory to see where that goes. There's a tactic, there's a plan. Then, and then there's the execution of that plan. And then, of course, there's the fulfilment of the plan. I use that as an illustration. Because uh, maybe you can relate to that in your own life. You know, we make plans, don't we? Maybe it's, you're not a cricketer. Maybe you're in business or maybe you're in the workplace or maybe there are plans for your family that you want to see happen. And if you're in business, you have strategic plans and operational plans and, and you, you like to see them follow through and when they reach the trajectory that you have for them, it's a good feeling, isn't it? It doesn't always happen though, but when you hit the mark, it's a really, really good thing. I'm going to just take a moment to talk about our strategic plan for this church and I'm not going to spend a long time on it, I will get into the Bible... But suffice to say, back in May, we gathered together as a congregation to think about who we are and who we want to be and where is God leading us and what are we called to do. And through quite a, an extensive process, we've come out with this document here called the St Paul's Strategic Plan towards 2028. And there's a bunch of them printed out on the back table if you want to grab one. And I hope you will, and I hope you'll have a read of it. And really, this is not a full, extensive strategic plan. It's more of a, a strategic framework that we're hoping will lead to plans and goals and so forth. Um, we have a, a vision statement. We have a, a statement about our mission, why we exist. And we've got a number of values in there, and I want you to read them. And you can read them and you can say, well, are we really like that? Or is this just aspirational? The other thing that you'll find in this document is that we're going to be focusing on three strategic areas. And I'm not going to go through them all, but I do want to go through the first one with you. The strategic area that we want to focus on as a church, and the first one, is growing connections. Growing connections. This is what it says. Our church is a place where people feel they belong. A strong, vibrant Christian community experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. This is reflected in the vibrancy and quality of our activities and connections. And this is our goal. We will work together to create a calendar of events and activities that connect, engage and unite our church community. Now, we sort of do that already, don't we? but maybe we can be a little bit more intentional. And as I'm speaking about it, you might go, you know what, I, I'd like to be involved in that. I'd, be really, I'd like to talk about that and, and have a part to play. Designed by and with people, and that's why I'm putting it out there to you, we will listen and understand their needs and aspirations. We will build a strong and diverse team of volunteers to support development and delivery. And then it goes on to our top three priorities. Suffice to say that we want to begin to formulate our trajectory in a much more meaningful way. To be hitting the mark, to be executing that in the very best way possible for building connections between all of you together, but also to build connections with the community around us, ultimately to be able to share the good news of Jesus, right? To be able to be the people that God calls us to be. Well, how does all of that relate to expectation and arrival? or How does it relate to our readings? Well, it's to say this. God has a plan. God has a trajectory for you. 
a trajectory for us. God has a plan. And just like those batsmen, God has thought about what is going to happen. And God is in the process right now of executing that plan for our lives. And that should give us great hope. It should give us great hope. Because those plans that God makes will be fulfilled. As we think about what is it we're expecting and what are we waiting for, we are waiting for the one true living God to be revealed and for the, the end to come where there will be a resurrection and a new body and all these wonderful promises that we have. We are expecting the fulfilment of God's promises to us. Amen. And that's the tension, isn't it? Because we know God has done the work, but we're waiting to see it outworked in our lives. But God has a plan. We're not living in a life that is being tossed and blown around by the winds and the waves of the world. We, we are people of God who are in step with the Spirit of God and working within the mission of God in the world. We are completely in the centre of where God wants us to be right now and his plans for us will be fulfilled. This is the good news. I want to try and demonstrate this to you from the scriptures today. God spoke to people in the past. He made promises to them and those promises were fulfilled. And they can also be fulfilled for us in the here and now. And not only that, we have a, huge, a future that I've been talking about that we hope for her for. So effectively, God has a trajectory. And that's a great message of hope because if you're feeling like things are a little bit out of control, it's great to know that actually God has everything in the palm of his hands and that you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to feel uncertain. You can feel secure in your life, no matter what is buffeting you. This is the good news. Last week, we considered Isaiah's messianic prophecy in chapter 9. I'll read to you again, just to remind you, from verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Well, this week, our reading comes from a different prophet. It's the prophet Micah. And Micah was one of Isaiah's contemporaries. Um, in fact, so a lot of scholars would argue that they may have known about one another's writings, actually, because they had the same audience and they were around at the same time. You remember last week, we talked about following the reign of King Solomon, the the, the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. You had the, the northern kingdom with the ten tribes and in the southern kingdom you had the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And it was a, a very difficult time for Israel because um, there, there was a lot of uh, unrest. They, the Assyrians were coming to invade and there was a lot of corruption. And, and it's, it's fair to say that many of the Israelites in those days were poor and marginalised and probably felt really oppressed because those who were in power were the minority and those that weren't were the majority. Now, not much has changed, has it? I mean, I think that's the way the world works. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. And if you go through the whole book of Micah, all the prophecies, and I'm not going to do the whole book, but there are certain themes that come out. There's social injustice God is speaking into the social injustice that people were experiencing in that time. The land grabbing, the exploitation, the corruption among the ruling class. And there were corrupt leaders and Micah spoke to those leaders. He rebuked the rulers that were um, doing these things, abusing their power and not upholding justice and righteousness. And, and the people were engaged in false worship and idolatry. They were worshipping idols and they were worshipping Baal and other gods and, and they didn't turn back to God, the one true God. And there was a disregard for God's laws. There was disobedience. 
dishonesty, violence. And if you read Micah, he talks about all of these things going on in the society that God, and he's using God's words, he's speaking God's words to say God is aware of this. God knows about this and God isn't going to stand idly by and do nothing about it. God will respond. And not only that, and this is one that I think is really interesting, there was a real spiritual apathy in the community that Micah was a part of. He highlighted this spiritual apathy and a lack of genuine devotion among the people. And he urged them all to have a deeper relationship with God and to live in accordance with God's will. These are the things that Micah prophesied. He called for repentance and he pleaded the people to recognise their sins and turn away from their wrongful ways and turn back to God. Now, many preachers will sum up Micah with the very famous scripture, Micah 6 verse 8, which is, He has shown you, O mortal man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? I'm sure you all know it. To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We often say that. But we often forget about the things that Micah was prophesying into and we don't begin to reflect on our own lives to say, hey, am I, how am I going? How am I going when it comes to living out my faith? In the midst of all that, we have this scripture reading from today, which a little bit like Isaiah from last week, offers us a glimmer of hope. You know, you can look at all the bad things going on in your life, you can look at all the bad things going on in the world, and you can focus your mind on those things, and you know, the more you focus on them, the bigger they get, they become more amplified when you can't stop thinking about them, when in actual fact we should be thinking our minds onto the things of God. But this is what Micah says. Let's pick it up from chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labour bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. As 21st century Christians, we can't help but read that through the lens of the cross. And of course, we see the words shepherd and Bethlehem and um, she who will be in labour and bear a son and all these things and we can't help but overlay our understanding of the prophecy fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But if we think only in those terms, we lose what the scripture is actually saying for the people of Micah's day in their here and now, if we just jump straight to the birth of Jesus. Because God, Yahweh, spoke to people at a particular time and a particular place for a particular purpose and that's what Micah was doing for those people then in their here and now and he was witnessing to the fulfillment of what God was going to do for them God was also expressing to them his awareness of their situation and his awareness of the plight that they had And it spoke about his willingness to intervene and bring transformation. Now, to me, that's a wonderful message. It's to say that God's promises can be fulfilled for those people, even even while they're waiting. And the same is for us. Those Israelites who are marginalised and oppressed, this is the promises that God identified with them in their situation. He knows their plight and he has a plan and a trajectory to actually deal with those things. God has a plan and a trajectory to deal with those things today as well. Now, it's multi-layered because the prophecy isn't just for them. 
The prophecy is for us as well, however many thousands of years later. God understands the injustices in your life. God understands where you feel marginalised or where you feel oppressed. And God is at work to redeem your situation as well. It's also multi-layered in the fact that as we look through the cross, we see that the culmination in the, of this prophecy is in the birth of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, hundreds of years later in Bethlehem. Of course, Jesus was born and Jesus spoke of himself as the Prince of Peace and the Good Shepherd. And if we jump forward to the Gospel reading to his birth, we see Joseph ready to quietly divorce Mary because she's become pregnant. And this is what happened. Let's read it again. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, God is about to hit that ball out of the park with the birth of his son Jesus and to really put in motion the trajectory of the salvation of the whole world, the whole cosmos. And that includes you. Joseph was a man who was faithful to the law. And, you know, he wanted to please God and he thought the best thing to do is not to disgrace Mary, but to quietly divorce her. But God had a different plan. And it was that she would give birth to a son and they would name him Jesus and he will save people from their sins. And that promise was fulfilled and it was the same promise to Micah and to Isaiah the ones that we read during this Advent season and it was fulfilled when our Lord Jesus shed his blood on the cross at Calvary to atone for the to become a sufficient sacrifice we say it every week in our Thanksgiving Eucharist liturgy where we say that he was sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and God's wrath the punishment was taken on Jesus and that's a punishment that is in duly ours this is why we can come every week and we can pray our prayer of confession knowing that God is faithful to forgive God doesn't want people to be living in a life of guilt and a life of shame and a life of self-deprecation, but rather God wants us to have the life that Jesus paid the price for us to have. Not only did she, Jesus show us how to live in peace through forgiveness and reconciliation and the grace of God revealed in him, but Jesus demonstrated what it is to live a life that is about serving others and serving God. And this is the trajectory that we're called to as we wait faithfully and patiently, as we anticipate, be people of anticipation and expectation, knowing that Jesus is coming back. I said earlier, you know, there's a lot of hype around Christmas and all the wonderful massive families getting together on TV ads and all the food and all the celebration. It's all, it's all marketing because our lives are not that beautiful, are they? They're a bit harder than that. And uh, Christmas is actually a time when it's often hard for most people, believe it or not. It's a time where we're reflecting on the year and we're looking at the brokenness in our lives and we're saying, Lord, was it any better than the year before? I believe it is. I believe God is continuously at work in our lives teaching us, guiding us, shaping us. And yes, it's often through persecution of some kind or even suffering. 
to follow Christ, to be laying down your life, letting go, forgiving, all these things that we're called to do, life is, life is sometimes pretty hard and life is full of disappointments as well. And bad news comes our way. We, we, can, we can feel at this time of year very, very lonely or even depressed. And I know, I know for a fact that some people here are feeling that way. But if that's you, I would ask you today to search your heart and find within yourself just that small mustard seed of faith to be able to take those disappointments or take those feelings and, and to say, Lord, I'm, going to, I'm actually going to do something with this suffering. I'm not going to dwell in it. I'm not going to allow the suffering to shape me, but rather I'm going to use this suffering for good and I'm going to refocus it onto Jesus because he's the one that took it on the cross. It's to give it away, to hand it over to the Lord and say, Lord, you take this from me because, Lord, you came to actually give me life. And when we celebrate Christmas, we're, we're celebrating the coming of life. It's, the, it's God himself becoming incarnate and bringing life and light and love to the dark world that we're all a part of. Take your suffering and refocus it, hand it on to Jesus and refocus and say, Lord, I'm, going to, I'm actually going to trust in you. Even in the, I might feel this way, my feelings can betray me. The truth is, Jesus, you rose from the dead and life is on its way. There is a trajectory of life, a trajectory of resurrection and a trajectory of victory for you because of what Jesus did. So take those feelings and give them to the Lord. Say, take it off me, Lord Jesus. Carry these burdens for me. That's the promise fulfilled right now for you. Right now you can do that. At the end of the service, there'll be people up here who will pray with you about your situation and help you to actually give it to the Lord. And that will bring transformation. It will bring lasting change for your life. So, again, what I said... You know, Jesus shows the fulfilment of his promises in the past, yes, in the present for you now, but also as we wait for the future that he has for us. Because the scriptures tell us that our trajectory is, as we who follow Christ, is resurrection, it's healing, it's a complete restoration. You know, it actually says <clears throat> that we will be raised and we will be like him. Yeah, I mean, that's an incredible thing, isn't it? So, as, as we celebrate Advent, let's get our mind on these things, you know. Let's, as a church, begin to get excited and begin to delve into what is the trajectory that God has for us. As we enter a new year, what new things is God going to do? You know, are we able to take our minds off the dark things in our lives and refocus them onto the loving life and light of Christ in our lives? That's what we're called to do as disciples. Let me pray. Loving and gracious God, this, uh, this whole message is about promises being fulfilled. And there are many people here today who might feel like their promises are going by the wayside. But Lord... The message is one of hope where, no, you have not forgotten us. Lord, we are, as it were, on a trajectory of life and the, the fulfilment of life in its fullness through Jesus our Saviour. Help us, Lord, to allow our minds to be shaped by your truth and may we have the will and the faith to step forward to take steps to enter into that life which you so graciously died to give us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite Roseanne to come and pray. Catch up with one another over coffee.